think first off, I'll dive right in. Um, you know, why don't each of you give me um, a little bit of an introduction from uh, what your roles are with the company and uh, where your company is presently in terms of supplying ingredients and 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 where the the, the core component of your company's competency is. Okay, you go ahead. No, no, go ahead. All right. So first, I'll start talking about myself. So my role primarily in the company is lies on the technical side of work. Uh, so my day to day work uh, includes managing the production activities, the research and development work that we're doing and any other, uh, you know, operational uh, parameters that are required in the company. That's what I'm looking at, how to ensure that the good quality raw material is received the right processes are followed and you know the best possible extracts are made available to our customers and how to maintain a good throughput through the month that are pending that are going to be fulfilled on a certain schedule so those are the things that i look at primarily along with that uh, my role also includes uh, managing the human resources the other consumables and resources within the company interacting with them ensuring that they are you know on the same uh, wavelength as we are as a company and uh, we are all moving forward in the same direction with the same goal with the same motives so that's what i do in this company uh, over to you and uh, hi i'm harsh so like how i like to put it my work in the company normally uh, is outside the factory so i look at most of the things that happen outside the factory uh, the financial aspect of it uh, with the banks and stuff, uh, the regulatory aspect, uh, raw material procurement to a great deal. Uh, there are certain sectors that uh, and certain uh, key raw materials that Yash looks after, but uh, other raw materials and consumables, bulk consumables, I am in charge of procurement and the domestic marketing that we have been doing till now. So the B2B domestic marketing, bulk marketing, I've been looking after. Again, we have our clients. So some of that is based on a client to client basis but bulk of the marketing activities is what I'm handling right now. Okay. Now you guys have mentioned that there's a, a potential a company rename ha in, the, in the works. Um, you yeah. guys are considering rebranding the, the company. So currently the company is Raft Bricks, correct? That's right. And what, what, is the, what is the significance of Raft Bricks? So Raft Bricks is the parent organization. This is the company which was founded by our father in uh, I think 80, 1987. So it's been in continuous operation for a period of about 37 years now. Uh, the line of business has got nothing to do with what we are doing in the world of extracts. It's primarily to do with the uh, furnaces and the bricks and the heat resistant bricks which are used to make furnaces. So that's what he works with. He supplies those to those furnaces and you know provides them technical support also for design and implementation of, uh, you know, those furnaces. Right. So when we came into business, uh, we took forward the name because by that time it was already a group uh, comprising of three companies. And this was the fourth company that we uh, added into the group. Uh, this company was started as a subsidiary of the parent company. So it's essentially Raftbricks Private Limited is the parent company. And Raftbricks Essential is just a trade name within that. The process that we are now on is to separate carve this out as a completely new company out of the parent company. And uh, we have a few options, but uh, we would go ahead. We would still maintain the name Rafrix because, you know, this holds a lot of emotional and uh, historical significance to our family. Uh, but probably the name that we're going to go forward with is going to be Rafrix Extracts. Because we feel that where we are as a company right now, the word extracts is much more relevant than the word essentials, uh, which uh, also, you know, sometimes does lead to a little bit of uh, confusion with the fact as to what we are doing. Uh, because a lot of people in the trade shows that we participate in uh, try to approach us for essential oils, which is not, not the primary, primary focus of our business. We do work with a few of them, but that would comprise not more than 5 to 10% of our total business. So that is what we're doing. Uh, the primary reason for the name change would be to actually, you know, uh, carve out the extracts business uh, as a separate entity now. 
uh, which is still a part of the umbrella, which is the Rashbrakes Group, but operates as an independent company. Currently, it operates as a subsidiary of the primary company. And how many years ago did you guys uh, start up the subsidiary? So this started off in 2016 is when we got commercial operations. Uh, the ideation and the project implementation started in 2013. Uh, so it's been 10 years since we've been working on this project and uh, about seven years since when we've been uh, commercially manufacturing our extra. We will complete uh, seven years at the end of August. This at year. the end of August. Wow, congrats. And, and so you guys are very young. You guys are carrying on your family yeah. legacy. Um, you guys, you guys can't be more than 35 years old, right? Yeah, so I, I, I am, I'm 34 and even though he looks much younger, he's 38. You, you got the mean correct. Hey, yeah. so the mean of our ages is around 35. Yeah. Hirsch is 35? That, I, we, we, we missed a bit of what you said. Your, uh, no, sorry, was, I, uh, I heard, Yash, you're 34. Hirsch, how old are you? I, I'll turn 38 this October. Oh, wow. So listen, you guys both are still, I mean, you guys look great. You guys are incredibly young. Um, one of the things that I'm, be I've begun to realize with more clarity is the youth of India picking up legacy businesses or taking on businesses or extensions of their uh, family legacy businesses, creating their own path. Um, finding uh, a niche or, or something new to add to the family legacy. Um, it's a different type of, it's a different type of uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, you know, when, when, when I started in industry in the early 2000s, I would meet um, the successors of, of companies that were built maybe in the 60s and the 70s. Yeah. And, and, and those, those youngsters were very much committed to just taking what was built and extending it, taking, just continuing yeah. what was built. Um, you guys must have had the opportunity to take that road, but you guys decided to carve a brand new path. What, what is it that led you into the extract realm? So, you know, we both, uh, you know, uh, did our postgraduate education. We finished around the same time. In 2013 is when we both finished our Masters in Business Administration, uh, you know, serendipitously at the same time. But uh, we do have the opportunity to take the existing business forward and we are doing that as well. I mean, it's not like we are uh, going to abandon that line of work. Uh, but our father, he, you know, he's an extremely active man. He's 64 now. If you meet him, he, he will not look a day older than 50 to you. And uh, so he's he's got all the energy in the world to run that part of the business uh, primarily centered around his efforts currently. So we both realized that we have an opportunity and a lot of time at our hands uh, to, you know, do something new and uh, grow the umbrella, which is the Rafbricks group, which is our family business. And uh, so that's, that's where the idea of doing something new came into the picture. Uh, as far as the extracts industry goes, you know, it was a long route to get here. Uh, our initial interest was to enter the food business, uh, the legacy business of our uh, family, ancestral business. ancestral business, which I would say before Rafrics came into the picture in 1987 was uh, oil extraction and wheat. So we were working with mustard oil and wheat. These were the two big products that my great grandfather and my great and my grandfather, they worked on. So, you know, there was always an affinity within the family to circle back to food in some way or the other. And uh, so when we were researching the different opportunities, spices was something which came up. But uh, the two of us, you know, we, we had this uh, uh, motivation to not do a very standard run of the mill, uh, you know, uh, treatment with the food industry that we want to enter into. So we were looking at that point at certain things which you would say were niche or innovative which could be done with food agri produce, but you know, lead to different sectors or different outcomes. And this is something we, uh, you know, in our research, we found this industry, it appealed to both of us. Uh, and we were one of the first pe people in Northern India to actually enter the spice extract business. We have a lot of herbal extracts in Northern India where people are using these Himalayan herbs and roots and things like that. 
uh, you know, your ashwagandha or your bakopa or your things like that. So that was traditionally what was done in the north. And what we realized was that spices was something which was done in the south. So we were one of the first companies who actually put up a spice extract plant in the north where you would say we have a geographical disadvantage, but you know, we found some synergies here which we thought would be uh, suitable to go for it. And uh, yeah, and since our inception, we've quadrupled our uh, production capabilities and uh, we've uh, established ourselves as one of the uh, pretty notable suppliers to the India. That is what we've been. But within that real, within those limitations, we've quadrupled our work in seven years. Uh, and the technology that we uh, got, we were able to, you know, run it at about 120% of our capacity within the first two years of operation. So even the manufacturer was not rating the uh, capacities given to us as to what we were actually able to execute on those, uh, uh, you know, with that in, the same infrastructure. And then, yes, so as in, as in when the demand uh, kept growing for the product that we selected, which was uh, initially curcumin, and uh, because we had a very strong quality track record from day one, we've not faced any rejection or return in our business. So, you know, uh, that gave us the bandwidth to, you know, uh, supply to more than, you know, one or two major buyers. And within those buyers also keep expanding our capacity and keep demanding more, a bigger slice of the business. And so we've been able to do that till now, but now we feel that the time is right for us to, uh, you know, go for direct uh, relationships with the end users who are there in the international markets. And so that's, that's what we are aiming for over the next couple of years. Uh, I think that would be the primary, um, uh, you know, motivation of our uh, marketing efforts. So we want to now be established as a direct, direct exporter of this hub. So um, when it comes to curcumin, um, yeah. tell, us, tell us a little bit about your history with curcumin um, in general, um, your sourcing, where you're located, where your factory is located, and, and, and are, you, are you in a geographical advantage um, to work with curcumin and, 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 and if, in, in, in other, other ways that makes you a, um, you know, how does it make you a viable manufacturer for curcumin? So uh, in terms of pure geographical advantage, uh, I would say uh, no. Uh, traditionally, turmeric is, has been cultivated either in the central plains of India or down south in the states of uh, Tamil Nadu and uh, uh, Telangana uh, and the central plains near Mar in Maharashtra. Uh, however, uh, the apex body for spice research in India, uh, IISR, has been doing a lot of uh, research on hybrid varieties or natural varieties of turmeric, which can be cultivated in uh, northern India. So they have uh, reduced the the uh, total period uh, of from sowing to harvesting. The traditional ones or the earlier crops have been more than 11 months at times. Uh, they have got it down to about eight and a half months. They have a couple of varieties which they have uh, done on a pilot level. Uh, there are a few uh, farmer groups in, uh, in and around our area. So not in, in Himachal Pradesh and some regions of Uttarakhand who have started working with this particular crop. Um, where uh, our uh, expertise in curcumin lies um, is our strong sourcing network. Even though we are not geographically uh, very close, uh, located right next to the farm or to the, to the main areas, we have in the last seven years developed a very strong sourcing network of trusted and audited and verified vendors in niche regions. Uh, wherein we are guaranteed supply of the herb uh, throughout the season. Um, in addition, uh, a lot of technical prowess, in-house prowess and in-house advancements have been done um, in, our, in our plant uh, to ensure that the herb that we are getting, uh, the output that we are getting out of that uh, is is beats industry standards both in terms of quality, in terms of hygiene and food safety, and in terms of throughputs. 
So uh, uh, marrying these two points, we have been able to, you know, consistently be one of the top suppliers to the nutraceutical and the export houses in India, uh, in spite of being far away from them or far away from the uh, traditional regions. And we believe the same, uh, same uh, strong points of our company will help us become a viable supplier when we look to go abroad. Yeah, I think one Is of the things you like to add. Sorry. No, I, I wanted to just follow up on you mentioned no. that the the body, the, the central yeah. body that's based in the north. The can you tell me the acronym yeah. again? Uh, the I so so they are not based in the north. It's okay. Indian Institute of Spice Research. Indian Institute I I S R. I I S R. Got it. Yeah. So they, how they work is they have uh, multiple uh, uh, offices. The office that primarily works on turmeric, from what I know, is based out of Calicut in Kerala. Uh, okay. But what they right. do is they they uh, do research on spice varieties um, across the country, so as to increase uh, potentially increase the acreage cultivation acreage of any particular herb and uh, increase the total output that you can derive from that herb at a pan-India level. So they are working on uh, hybrid varieties. They are working on foraging, foraging for natural varieties. There, there is turmeric grown all over India. There are, there, there is a, there are a lot of turmeric grown in, in uh, Bihar. There is a lot of turmeric grown in Uttar Pradesh. There is a lot of turmeric grown in the hilly regions in Uttarakhand. So. Uh, this is the this is the entire Ganget, Gangetic plain. Uh, so there are a lot of universities here which are also doing research in you know taking the initial breeder seed from IISR and then further refining it or further uh, uh, giving out pilot projects, working with FPOs to see what is the exact niche where it works. So this particular variety uh, that they have developed. Uh, they basically came up with a seven and a half month window because the traditional turmeric cycle is the sowing happens in May, June, and the harvest happens in uh, from Feb to April. Now, a key challenge in North India is the winter months. Uh, in the central plains and down south, you don't have extreme winters. So when the uh, plant is at its, at its largest, uh, it does not have to, uh, you know, encounter a lot of dew and a lot of very tough cold conditions. So the, the traditional turmeric plant does not have to deal with that, but the North Indian plant would have to. So what they've tried to do is cut the uh, harvest cycle so that the plant is harvested before December. Uh, that was the main effort behind getting a seven and a half month window so that you, you basically take out the extreme winters out of the equation. You know, but I would just like to mention something here. Uh, these efforts by IISR are yet to yield uh, yeah. significant results. This is still an in, progress, it, yeah. an in progress project. And as far as our current sourcing model goes, it does not impact it significantly. Yeah. So that is not something that we would be, uh, you know, pitching to our clients that we are giving you a different variety of turmeric. We are not. We are also buying from the traditional markets currently, uh, but where we are able to compete uh, with our better placed, uh, uh, you know, com competitors is that is in two areas. Uh, one is pure efficiency. And when I talk about efficiency, it involves a lot of things. It's, a, it's about efficiency of your outputs, efficiency of the utilization of structure as well as efficient the industry leaders and on a lot of parameters, we're actually able to do better than them. Uh, and these are guys who've been in the industry for 30 years. So, you know, that's one part. And the second part is that uh, uh, there are other, uh, you know, uh, opportunities in the North. Uh, like I mentioned, there are herbs. Uh, there are a lot of uh, other sort of products that have Northern origin, uh, which are in sync with uh, you know the infrastructure that we had so the vision was always to you know use one product which is turmeric 
to propagate ourselves in the market, to learn the industry, and then you know move ahead and add a larger bouquet of products. So that's a process that we started somewhere about two years back. Uh, for the first five years, we were primarily a turmeric only company. Within turmeric, we we found a certain capacity in manufacture because you know you don't want to be manufacturing more. than what you could uh, reasonably sell at good value. So um, that are able to achieve those numbers. Like I mentioned, the efficiency part of it. So what used to take us 12 months to do in 2019, the same amount of curcumin we are able to deliver in eight months now. So we've you know, carved out a window in our production cycles where we are now able to explore other herbs. And uh, the ones we've gone for a lot of them, uh, the ones which we have successfully established are green tea, sisters quadrangularis, berberin, which is going to go live uh, in this winter. So berberin is going to be a prime, another major product for us going ahead because it has a lot of synergy with curcumin in terms of the way you have to handle the product, the way you have to manufacture the product, the issues of, you know, it can uh, cross contamination issues that we have already put systems in place to mitigate. So berberin is also something that we have now in process, we have stabilized mm -hmm. the product and we are in process of introducing it commercially and should should be able to do it by the end of the year. So, so with, yeah, so no, no. So I, I was just saying, so that's that's that. <laughs> so with uh, Berberin being live this winter, so um, yeah. at Supply Side West, we should be coordinating meetings with potential mm -hmm. Berberin customers who are looking, if it goes live in the winter, then you'd be completing deliveries by Q1. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. That's that's so that's, really that's the, the 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 limitation of going live in the winter is basically dependent on the crop cycle. Uh, sure. The berberin uh, root and the the logs that are required are usually available after the month of December. So in terms of the technical side of it, we are already in place to do it. The technical and the you know the research and the quality side of it, we are in place to do it. Now we are just waiting for the raw material to come in and just start to pro produce this material. And uh, we are very very uh, confident of achieving this product comfortably because there's a lot of synergy with turmeric in terms of how the process is run, in terms of what you need to do to ensure quality. So, and you know, all the products that we have tested or commercialized over the last two years, we found that we've been able to do it with a pretty high level of success, uh, primarily because of the systems we've put in place, uh, the quality assurance systems, the quality control system. We have one of the most robust quality control systems in turmeric. I mean, I would not be naming names, but uh, the biggest of biggest companies would not have the amount of in intermediate and in-process testing that we are doing. And uh, we are, you know, we are highly data driven in that matter. We capture a lot of our production data. We analyze, we find trends. We, you know, use that to plug the, any kind of inefficiencies, any kind of gaps in our processes. So when we are trying, when we, go ahead and replicate that onto a new product. We realize that the learnings of the last seven years are allowing us to uh, probably get a, you know, a jump start on the entire process of learning how to manufacture those products successfully. So green tea, we've been able to manufacture very successfully. We've already moved a lot of product within the Indian market. Uh, same goes for scissors and the same is expected for Berber. And what's the uh, specification for the green tea? Um in terms of caffeine, polyphenol content, ECGC? So polyphenol content, we can take it from 50 all the way up to 95, even 98. That's all, all doable. Uh, catechins and ECG, uh, usually for the 50% material, it's not standardized on catechins and ECG right. because uh, it's not really a parameter that the customers are looking at. Uh, for the 90 plus materials, we do standardize it. A lot of lots up to 70 percent catechins and up to 45 to 50 percent EGCG, but you know it keeps varying. Sometimes it's 60 catechin, 40 EGCG. So as per the customer requirements, we'll sort and segregate the lots, and uh, you know supply the uh, required quality. Uh, a lot of that also depends on the raw material that we're able to get. Right. So you know uh, in the process you can put in checks and balances to ensure that these uh, particular compounds are you know, coming at very high levels, but uh, 
sometimes if you're just you know a certain raw material is not able to deliver you can't do any much about it so yeah, you know you have to balance it out yeah and and you know this conversation is really supposed to be an extension of a conversation that we want to develop with your future clients uh, yeah, right. so the market in the united states is comprised of contract manufacturers who are manufacturing core brands and in some cases, they have the decision-making authority to source the material. And in other cases, contract manufacturers are supplied the raw materials by the brand owners. And my recent travels to India, uh, Hirsch, you were very kind to make your way out to the airport. We didn't have a chance to have a formal meeting, but it was really nice that you made it out there and, and we had a chance to connect. And you got a chance to meet Eric of Advanced yeah. GG. And, and it's really important for the brand owners to hear the, the, the details as far as, you know, even though it's in the weeds, but the efficiency discussion, the discussion about the, 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 the process that is being deployed, um, the ability to replicate and, and provide batch to batch consistency, even though that raw material itself year to year could differ there could be differences in, in potency and, and color. And, um, and so that you are working in different situations every year because the raw material is, is a little different. Um, from my side, I've seen that these conversations have to be with brand owners. We, we, we have to bring, you know, for you guys to spend so much time gathering data about your, your production and then implementing changes, upgrades, um, you're delivering a value add that is only going to be appreciated by the brand owner. Uh, a contract manufacturer is not going to listen to a single word of that, and it dilutes the value that you're putting into your operation. So, you know, I, I, I think this is just really the first wave of introducing manufacturers to brand owners you know, this you know right now we're on zoom and you know we'll, we'll cut this up and we'll probably put some clips up and use linkedin and 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 let people become aware of of you two as individuals you guys are brothers you guys are you know carrying forward a family legacy you're also setting into motion your own footprint in this nutrition nutritional industry um you know people need to know the principles of a company and you know if if we get stuck in price, they'll never care about who the owner is. They'll never care about what the pedigree of the company is. They'll never care about what the core values of the company are. Um, and so we're looking, we're looking to try to promote um, interaction between brand owners, manufacturers. And, uh, and I think the fact that you guys are not even 40 years old, you know, that, that, is, a, that is a very important detail because you guys are still building something. You have a lot at stake in terms of what you're trying to do, how long you plan on staying in this business. Um, and so lining up with a comparable brand that's also maybe early in its, in its journey, it could be five, you know, even a brand 10 years old, sometimes they're still very regional. They haven't broken out yet. Um, and so I think for Supply Side West, we have to definitely target uh, brand owners, uh, and even in our joint effort to reach out to potential customers, and 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 we'll have conversations about that. Uh, we want to target those guys because um, you know they'll value what you're doing. Um, and I think it's a lot of work to put into it, and I know too many people in the industry that don't care about it. They'll they'll tell me, well, they just give me the lowest price. They'll you know you you and I have we have exchanged a few emails. Yeah. just to test the waters and, you know, we'll leave names out of it. But, you know, the first email, I sent you a message. I said, listen, man, this is <laughs> going to be a race to the bottom. If we, yeah. if we, if we engage in this conversation, it's going to be like, how low can you go? And you're going to yeah. agree. Then they're going to go back to their counterpart and they'll agree. And they'll come back to you <laughs> and say, Hey, how low can you go? Um, you know, we don't want to do that. I think that's not good for our industry either because it introduces um, the bad actors into our industry. Yeah. It gives, if you lower the price enough, you're probably dealing with not so good actors. Um, so, you know, I think what you guys are doing is phenomenal. So let's take this from, you know, 2018, you guys mm -hmm. uh, 
2018-19. I think we met in 2019. Yeah, yeah. 19. Um, walk me through uh, the, the, the journey that you guys have experienced specifically with Curcumin, the market, where the market was when in 2018, yeah. the market was $100 a kilo. You know, like you could get orders for 100. I think I, I remember 2017, um, I had business locked in at like between 115 and 125 a kilo. Yeah. And on, yeah. and on granu yeah. granulated material, um, it was uh, it was higher. It was like closer to like 130. Yeah. And 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 this was contract business, and it was pretty recurring. There wasn't a lot of disruption. There weren't. I mean, there were always a lot of players of curcumin, relatively speaking, but it didn't it didn't really um, flood the market. Now we're looking at a flooded market. Walk us through what happened. What happened to the curcumin market in the last four years, five years? Well, uh, so we can perhaps speak uh, more uh, from an Indian uh, yeah, please. standpoint. I mean, within sure. India, what we have seen, uh, like till the time when we had met in 2019, this pre-pandemic, uh, curcumin was a pretty stable product. The prices were uh, going down a little bit from the time when we had started in 2016. So I would say if in 2016 to 2019, the prices would have gone down by about 12 to 15% on average. Uh, uh, two changes that we saw, uh, one which we had foreseen or we started getting an inkling of when in 2019 was that, uh, there were uh, there was a lot of capacity that was being installed on curcumin in India uh, in terms of new manufacturers uh, and uh, there were talks of uh, capacity being doubled in a matter of a year in terms of the uh, uh, new companies that were coming in so that was one aspect uh, covid hit and uh, COVID affected the curcumin market in two ways. Uh, one, because turmeric traditionally has been an antioxidant and an anti as an immunity booster product. So the demand for curcumin shot through the roof. Uh, in 2020. In 2020, once COVID hit, right? In uh, from say March 2020 from Q2. Uh, with the supply chain issues that the world was facing. Uh, and the logistic issues that the world was facing, I think uh, countries like US and a lot of countries in Europe, uh, there was this feeling that the supply chain is going to be so bad for so long. And a, a lot of material was moved from India uh, to stateside in Q2. I mean, our demand within India shot through the roof in Q2. Like we were getting twice the demand that we had gotten till that point. Uh, so on one hand, the demand for curcumin shot up crazily. On the other hand, this new capacity was being built. And also the new capacity was also being driven by the exporters. So, yeah, okay. so you know, a lot of these exporters who would usually discourage you from coming into the industry were actually calling you up and say, why don't you expand? Why don't you invest? This is the right time. So a lot of people went ahead and did, did that, right? Yeah. And uh, the wave kind of, you know, reached its peak in around Q4 four of the year. And then there was a steady decline in that. And, uh, you know, because of that, uh, what happened was that suddenly by Q2 or Q3 of 2021, uh, you were left with a market where there was about 30 to 40% additional capacity. Sorry. And also because, you know, the nature of the industry is such that in India, we are producing four months before the material is, is actually reaching you state style, right? So we are first manufacturing, we are testing, then we are consolidating, supplying to the exporter. They are doing certain processes or certain, you know, quality checks at their end, then they are consolidating it further, then they're exporting it on a vessel, which takes about 45 days to reach you. And then there is about some Indian transport custom clearances. So, you know, the information of what is happening in the US market kind of reached us too late, wherein the manufacturers in India overproduced. We were, we were expecting a certain capacity 
movement which suddenly just dried up because you know the exporters realized that okay the demand isn't what it we expected it to be a lot of material was already shipped in anticipation of the demand which kind of got accumulated in these international markets and uh, you know that that led to a few shocks uh, but i'll just take this a little bit you know back so from 2016 to 19 what we saw the reduction in prices of curcumin were directly linked to the reduction in prices of the raw material the reduction in prices of curcumin i would not say were primarily driven by any external forces of uh, demand they were driven by supply uh, booms so what happened was that there were bumper turmeric crops year after year uh, the capacity of turmeric being grown in the country kept expanding so there was a lot of competition for our raw material suppliers and they ended up dropping their prices which led to the prices being dropped for the extract because you know right. what happens is that this industry is so small that a lot of all the buyers are very much aware of the actual costing so right. even though there is no particular reason to reduce the price and the demand is still strong the eventual buyer who holds the maximum power in this industry uh, knew exactly that okay these guys are now able to manufacture at 10% lower cost so my price needs to go down by 10% even though my sale price is going up so you know sure. that was that was what initially was happening but uh, as an in a manufacturer that was absolutely fine with us because our margins were stable our performance was stable uh, we were you know getting enough uh, headroom in our operations to invest back into the company and grow the company so 2019 20s when things started to get really tough for the industry so we've seen now in the last two years probably 20 to 30% of the new uh, the man the capacities being removed uh, plants shutting down people losing all their money uh, or some people who have been smart um, you know shifting to alternative products uh, those who have survived in the industry i think have survived for one of two reasons one they have a strong export market they are not essentially huge manufacturers they are pri- primarily traders so they just pass on the effects of the market decline on to their manufacturers and uh, two people who have been able to enhance their productivity and their efficiency in certain ways to you know mitigate the impact of these uh, uh, you know these downward forces in the market so i think we fall in the second category uh, of course we've also suffered uh, things are not as rosy as they used to be right. uh, but uh, we've been able to survive golden. this wave. they're not as golden as they used to be <laughs> <laughs> no we never we never, we never saw the we golden. never saw the golden era by the time we came in we were already on silver but probably it's not even copper anymore we are down to brass no i hear so, it they've been at their lowest i think in more than 15 years this year uh, so the farmers have actually opted not to sow this crop as extensively as they usually do so all the major buyers and you know uh, the turmeric which is grown in india uh, a very small fraction of it goes to the extraction industry uh, the bulk of it goes to the spice industry yeah because the table variety of turmeric is big in india every household and, and globally and globally and, yeah, and but, globally yeah and absolutely. globally right so if you are doing any kind of asian food you need turmeric uh, so what we are observing already and it's alarming actually is a almost doubling of prices of the raw material over a period of 15 days wow so what that would translate to over the next two months is approximately a 40 to 50% increase in the cost of curcumin and uh, we are also seeing trends on that and we are expecting that and now i am not saying it will happen maybe this spike which is being observed in the market will probably might be a blip might be a sustainable thing but yeah so what we are seeing right now is that there might be a trend of increasing prices and not a linear or a you know marginal increase there could be an exponential jump in the prices of curcumin just like we saw an exponential drop in the prices of curcumin from last year to this year from this year to the next year or maybe even before the end of the year we might see an exponential jump in the prices of curcumin uh maybe to the tune of 20 to 30 dollars or 40 dollars on top of what is already being paid for the uh, curcumin because 
uh, if that does not occur, uh, what would happen is the supplies will completely dry from India. Because now it is honestly for most people impossible to procure raw material until the prices of curcumin go up. So that's the model which you might see. So the insight so I'm trying to give you is time. this is the time right now. Any brand that is focused in the curcumin market, um, mm. if they have visibility into <clears throat> usage in 2024, this is the time right now to be planning 2024. Uh, procurement at today's prices. Otherwise, they're going to risk. They're going to risk. Um, you're su you're suggesting up to forty percent. I mean, I know you're not. I'm not quoting you, but based yeah. on the trend, and if this is not a blip, you know, this is a factor. I mean, everything is subject to so many other things. But yeah. Yeah. the 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 industry from your side, from the raw material, from the spicing side, it shows that there is a trend upward on the raw material cost, and that's going to trickle down into the extract price, you're saying that it could go up 40% from where the pricing is now. 40% is what we expect at minimum. At minimum. So that, I mean, so that brings it back to almost a normal, like the normalized level, right? Like over the historic, like, like from 2000 and like I said, 2015 to 2000. Not, not really. It brings it back to the 2021 levels. Okay. Yeah. But to, I mean, 40% uh, would bring it back to the 2021 levels and the 2018-19 levels uh, might take longer to achieve, might have happened, but uh, what we do expect is at least that much needs to happen for the industry to remain in operation. Thanks for watching. Please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe.